Why is everybody getting Omicron? This is Dr. David and let's talk about it. Hi everybody, I hope that you're doing well today. Um, it sure does seem that if us ourselves are not getting sick, we all know somebody who has gotten sick and many people for most in most cases over the past several weeks. And of course, it's all about Omicron. Now, why is this happening? Now, first and foremost, we've been hearing about how much more transmissible, how much more contagious that Omicron is compared to previous um, variants. There's almost no more Delta now, like 99% of all cases in America are, as well as most of the world, are now Omicron. So that's obviously very good because we certainly know at this point that Omicron is not as dangerous as Delta and as far, even as far as like going back Alpha, Beta, etc. And so obviously if there's a less virulent, less dangerous um, um, happening out there, then that's obviously going to mean that less people are going to get really sick or die. And that's obviously a very helpful thing. Now, um, we've this ha with the mutations that are being seen, and you've probably heard that there are over 50 mutations that are being seen in Omicron that wasn't being seen in previous variants. So you know, if you follow the genetic lineage, there went from the original COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2 to an alpha, beta, gamma, then delta. And each of them kind of were getting a little stronger um, or had some other types of qualities that made it more transmissible, but was still stronger. But Omicron seems to be taking a genetic path that's in a different direction, that is more in the direction of um, and having genes with the, the more common cold coronaviruses that weren't there for the Delta and up that line there. So this may be kind of a different path that's being taken. Of course, no way of knowing whether it's going to be a further variant down that line or coming back to the um, to the Delta um, in that line. But of course, we're going to know that over over time, but hopefully we won't see much of that anymore because of the community immunity, the herd immunity that everybody has gotten at this point for a ver variety of reasons. Now, the mutation itself has been, a lot of the mutations has happened with the spike protein. Um, but of course, the the genes that are part of the common cold that we're being seen over, that's part of the transmissibility. But then the question comes about, why is everybody getting it? So many people have had the wild virus. So many more people have had the vaccine, including being boosted. So shouldn't we be protected? And the answer is no, because the antibodies that have been created, whether it was from past virus or past vaccine, aren't covering for the vac uh, aren't covering for Omicron very well. So I have a very high tech demonstration for you today. This is a cup that's upside down. Okay, so let's just say that this is the spike on the on the uh, on the on the on the on the on the on the coronavirus. Okay, and this spike is what then fits into the ACE receptor of the cell, then opens up the cell and allows for the virus to get in and for the um, to then replicate and to spread. Okay, now if this was an antibody that was generated previously from vaccine or from previous strains. We now have a complete coverage of that, okay? So now that spike protein can't get to the ACE receptor of the cell because there's this coating on it, okay? And so that is the reason why those antibodies, why the previous monoclonal antibodies, which I'll talk about more in a second, were so effective because it was a very strong match, okay? Now, let's say that, the, um, that those antibodies, so now let's call this the um the the um omicron spike okay and let's call this the new the um the antibodies from before okay so now it's not a very good coverage or perhaps even better more like that where some of the some of the um the spike protein is able to be covered but there's still parts of it and there maybe maybe there's some like this maybe there's some like that but the thing is is that the spike protein is now being much more able to get to this ACE receptor of the cell get into the cell and replicate. So that is the reason why we are seeing this. Now I'm gonna pick up the paper I just dropped. My notes. Okay, so um, that's the reason why we're not getting good coverage. And of course, if there's not coverage, people are going to get sick, okay? Thank goodness, because this is more of a common cold um, genes involved. And the fact that it's staying more to the upper airway as opposed to down into the lungs, not as much getting into the bloodstream, as we've talked about before, that's, of course, part of the reason why we're just seeing a lot of people who are getting sick, but not seeing nearly the amount of hospitalizations and deaths are not going up proportional relative to the sheer number of cases that we're seeing. And, you know, if we're reporting 750,000, a million cases in America, 
the reality is that because there's so many people who are not getting tested or who are doing home tests and finding out, but they're not reporting it because there's no reporting system for that, it could very well be that the number is two to three times higher than the reality of the reported numbers that we're seeing. Okay. And again, of course, we know that the more that those numbers go up, the more community immunity we have. Um, now, part of this also, you know, we've been hearing that people, oh, it's just a mild cold. And of course, we did hear that for some people are asymptomatic for the previous variants as well. But I think it's important for people to understand that for many people, it's still not just a mild cold. It could be a pretty brutal flu-like illness. Now, one of my closest friends um, who was both fully vaccinated for two plus boosted and who also had her antibody levels. You may have heard me talk about the semi-quantitative total IgG for the for SARS-CoV-2 um, and what I've referred to as being in the 2500 club, which means having the antibody level so high that the laboratories can't even report it because 2500 is the upper end of the reporting limit. And she still caught it last weekend. It was pretty brutal for the past few days. She does seem to be kind of being a little in the right direction now. So we're kind of trending in a better direction. But, um, you know, it was not pleasant. And again, people, um, you know, should be aware of that, that, you know, that, you know, if you have it, don't be making plans for the next uh, for the next few days. You know, it's still, you know, be, don't be around people, especially if they're high risk. So, you know, coming back to should be quarantined in the house, um, you know, especially if there's somebody high risk in the house um, or for that matter, if like somebody is going to be around somebody who's at high risk. So let's say, for instance, we, you know, you catch it, your kid catches it. OK, now, of course, it's still really important to do that type of quarantining. And, you know, even though they say five days later, you can go back out with wearing a mask, which I strongly advise. There are still people who are contagious after five days. So being mindful of that, but kind of keeping to that um, that scenario, let's say that there's a teacher in the classroom who is high risk. So could a symptomatic but not bad parent give it to a mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic child who can then, because of the transmissibility, pass it along to a high-risk adult like a teacher, that scenario is absolutely possible. So just being mindful that we're all in this together and that our actions do impact other people, even if we handle it just fine because we have great vitamin D levels and great zinc levels and we start the immune and the COVID protocol as soon as we start to get sick, that's not everybody. That's obviously a small percentage of people. Obviously, part of the reason why I'm making these videos is that it's becomes a larger number of people who follow um, this seemingly very helpful advice. But of course, we know not everybody is. So just being mindful of that. Now, in terms of the medicines that are available, that's another challenge because the monoclonal antibodies that have been very successful during the previous variants. And you may have heard me say, hey, if you get COVID, if there's anything more than the slight cold, go get monoclonal antibodies. But that's not helpful now because it's not, the antibody is not matching the, the spike protein of Omicron. So there, and that's with the Regeneron and the other brand, I forget the name of it. Um, but there is one from Eli Lilly um, called Sotr, I have to pronounce this, so Trovimab, that does have seemingly have good protection for the Omicron, but it's really hard to find. It was the least available prior to this. It's kind of all used. Really, you can't, I, you can't just go to an infusion center. Everybody just get it because there's not that supply. It has to be somebody who's much more high risk. And I don't even know at that point where the supply is. Certainly, it will be there um, in the next month or two as the company starts making more. But do not be relying on monoclonal antibodies to, um, to be there for you if you were to catch Omicron now. Now, also, the medicine that you've heard me talk about, Paxlovid, which is the um, which is the Pfizer medicine. You know, there's the other medicine from Merck, but, you know, we were seeing that was only working at 30 percent um, as opposed to much, much higher, closer to 90 percent for the Paxlovid. And of course, um, I guess if there's nothing else out there and someone's handling down a, 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 sl a, a bad slope, sure, I guess that would that be better than nothing? Maybe. Um, but again, Paxlovid, as you know, the, the, the manufacturing is just being um, picked up now. Yes, in a few months from now, we should see very ample supplies of it. Of course, Omicron wave will be over by then. Who knows where we'll be? Um, but again, you know, so right now we are really stuck with really just, you know, working through it. You know, or and of course, doing the things that we've talked about to try to make it uh, an easier go and uh, less contagious for long, shorter periods of time. OK, now the good news. The good news is that if we are following in America the same pattern that we saw first in South Africa and then in, in, in the United Kingdom, 
where we saw this huge spike happen, but then a very quick, um, you know, for the wave. And then, but it's also coming down very quickly. So South Africa at this point, while it's certainly not back to where the baseline was in October, it's like way, way down there. And we're starting to see that in the United Kingdom. We are also starting to see that in certain states up north um, as well. Um, we don't know whether that's happening in Florida here. We'll certainly should know over the course of the next few weeks, um, Part in part because Florida officially only reports once a week. So we can't see those numbers change, but we'll see it eventually. And certainly, you know, until the percent positivity goes down, that's the number of swabs that test positive. Um, you know, that's going to be when we really know um, where we are with how likely a person is to get it if they go out. And of course, by then, if people have antibodies, whether because they are partially covered from the past vaccine or past, um, vir um, past variant, or even more importantly, if they are helpful, I should say, if they had Omicron and they have antibodies, of course, they now have antibodies against Omicron. But one of the interesting findings out of research out of South Africa is that the antibodies that are being made for Omicron actually seems to be doing quite protective in terms of covering the lab test of the Delta and the previous variants. So Omicron may be helping kind of all over globally. And of course, if a future variant were to come along that's more down the Omicron or more down the Alpha, Beta, Delta, um, but the Omicron is giving antibodies to people, that's kind of like a best case scenario, right? So, um, That'll be, you know, something that will kind of continue to follow. But of course, does that lead us to the question, is this the beginning of the end? Of which a lot of people were hearing it from the CDC. We're hearing it from health experts of what we're seeing elsewhere. Um, you know, as you may know, I follow Dr. John Campbell religiously on his YouTube channel. I highly make, recommend watching it on a daily basis. He is reporting the numbers every day. That's where I'm getting all of my data from it because he reviews data from all around the world. Um, thank you, John Campbell, for not making me do um, three hours worth of research before I do all of these videos. But just a wonderful source and what seems to be just a wonderful chap. So, um, uh, so kudos to Dr. Campbell for making it this much more interpretable and being that you don't, um, that you're doing it in an unfiltered and an unbiased way. And of course, that's the way I like to present things as well. So, uh, so yeah, so, uh, you know, thank you again, Dr. Campbell. Um, now, of course, um, if we are able to move this into an endemic situation, what does that mean? That in the that probably means it will be moving into more of like what a typical cold and flu season is. And of course, we know that people are more likely to get colds and flus in the wintertime. Why? Because people are congregated more indoors, especially if they're up north and not hanging out as much as we are here in Florida, where it is a lovely 72 degrees here in Boynton Beach, Florida, which is wonderful. Um, of course, if you're up north, you may be gritting your teeth as I, as I said that. Um, but also, you know, vitamin D. And when people are congregated indoors and it's cloudy out all winter time, they're not getting any vitamin D from the, um, from the sun. But of course, that's the reason why we keep on advocating for taking vitamin D at least from a minimum, but more importantly, checking your vitamin D level and getting it to the middle part of range. And of course, the same thing for zinc as well. All righty. So as long as people can do that, of course, don't forget the immune protocols that we've, that we've posted before um, in terms of what to do when you start to get sick. Also, you know, in the in the articles that we posted before that um, we've we've said that, uh, you know, there are certain things to take when you start to get sick. But if you feel like it's kind of lingering more, getting stronger, there are other things to be taking to be doing in the um, immune protocol. Um, that is like what to do at that point, you know, more anti-inflammatory things, um, things like really hitting up things like curcumin, high dose um, omega-3 um um, high, high doses of bioflavonoids, high doses of vitamin C um, to try to keep the immune system, the cytokines from uh, exploding. And we'll put the, uh, the link to that document again here in the, uh, in the comment section below. All right. So uh, that's what I have for you for today. Um, thank you for listening. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. If you haven't shared it with other people, please do so. You know, a big part of this is we're trying to get these types of messages out to the masses. And so the more that we can be sharing it uh, on, on this video and uh, sharing it on our other social media platforms, then the more that other people know what you and I now know. All right. So hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.